Good afternoon. I'm Jana Martin, Chief Executive Officer of the American Insurance Trust, known to most of you simply as the Trust. We're delighted that you're able to join us virtually today for our next webinar. The Trust is pleased to once again partner with Drs. Sarah Smucker Barnwell and Margo Adams Larson to present these telehealth community chats. They've done a tremendous job with this series, and I know I and our policyholders appreciate their expertise and the time and effort that goes into putting these together. In the interest of time, I've placed their bios on a slide for you. I'm sure you will enjoy and benefit from our telehealth chat today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Smucker Barnwell and Adams Larson. Thank you, Dr. Martin. And thank you to the Trust for having us today. And thank you to everyone for logging in and joining us. Margo, it's great to see you. I cannot believe it is our 20th telehealth community chat. It's pretty amazing. And I echo all of those gratitudes. Um, this is one of my favorite parts of, I used to say the month, but now it's the quarter <laughs> to get to spend some time and talk about some of those things that are pressing on people's minds about telehealth. And, you know, this is just a reminder, we're doing this quarterly. There's some news items that we'll chat about here in just a moment, but it's really a discussion of the practical how-tos in terms of the ethical perspectives of telehealth. We do this as a conversation. We don't have um, slides to show, but there will be some things that we drop in the chat and that the team behind us helping us support this will drop in the chat. So you can grab those as we go along in our conversation. And we welcome you to use the Q&A to ask questions. We'll be keeping an eye on those as we go. And we also go through uh, the evaluations at the end as well and pull those questions forward into some of the content we have today. So super excited to get into that. Well, you mentioned news, and I think that's where we were going to start. Since we are meeting quarterly, a lot of things happen, you know, between each chat. And so we were going to kick off with a couple of items that have occurred since our last chat. Um, so I'll get us started. And I think we we're going to start today with a piece of federal legislation that's pretty new, the Tech to Save Moms Act. Um, this is an act that invests in and promotes the integration and development of telehealth and other digital tools that help reduce maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity. So the bill supports use of technology to improve and address disparities, in particular in maternal mental health outcomes. So quite specifically, what it means is that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation may test telehealth models to screen and treat common pregnancy-related complications for Medicare, excuse me, Medicaid enrollees. And in addition, the Department of Health and Human Services are going to be granting awards to evaluate and expand technology-enabled learning models that provide services to pregnant and postpartum women, um, particularly in those in traditionally medically underserved areas, um, to help reduce disparities, specifically racial and ethnic disparities um, in maternal health outcomes by increasing access to digital tools. So I think, you know, later today, we're going to talk a little bit about the burgeoning area of data talking about disparities in telehealth. So I'm really heartened to see this. I think it is a good step towards understanding the sort of the, the wide scale commitment to um, improving uh, reducing notable gaps in access. So I, I'm trying not to get too ahead of myself. So I think this is um, definitely a, a good step towards, you know, helping to improve, you know, what we can do. Because at, at the end of the day, uh, telehealth is about access. So I think we'll talk a little bit more about it later. But wanted to share that. Um, additionally, we had the American Psychological Association and the American Counseling Association both opine on the use of social media among youth. And so today we're gonna to just talk very briefly about it. I really encourage anyone who's interested um, to visit the American Psychological Association or the ACA, American Counseling Association websites where they've posted this information. Um, we'll focus a bit on the American Psychological Association. We are four psychologists by psychologists at the trust. Um, but you know, with this caveat that you know, it'd be a little bit incomplete. So you know, each of them, I think, interestingly began with the note that 
you know, they're not trying to opine that social media is inherently harmful. You know, their statements really were, this is how we can help people engage in a way that allows them to glean some of the positive impacts that increase our connectivity to one another, increase, uh, decrease our isolation, um, while also being really cognizant of the deleterious impacts that social media can have on behavioral health, which I think we're finding more and more in outcomes data. So very briefly, um, you know, some of the themes they talked about Really, I think they focused on pro-social use, you know, how to use these tools to help young people make connections that are positive and healthy and, you know, that are developmentally appropriate. So, you know, for me, my big takeaway from reading their recommendations had a lot to do with monitoring, adult monitoring, to make sure that kids aren't just, you know, left free to surf these uh, tools with no guidance, um, content monitoring to make sure that they are getting age-appropriate content. Um, discriminating, but helping kids discriminate between, you know, what is real information, what is not real information. I think that's something that would be helpful broadly um, and to help screen for problematic use. And I think there's a strong emphasis on all things in moderation saying, yes, this is, you know, something that is in the lives of young people now, but how do we make sure that this is not the majority of how they're socializing, making sure that this does not interrupt their sleep or their participation in other, you know, uh, in real life activities. Um, they had a lot to say about helping young people understand the concept of social comparison and that when people look at social media, very typically they're looking at a very curated snapshot of another person's life, the highlights reel only. And to really help them in this concept of social media literacy to understand that that's not you know, always real life. Um, above all, you know, both talked about continuing research, APAs in particular talked about how we can continue our research in this area to really inform healthy use. And, and I really, you know, from my perspective, I'm just acknowledging it is not opining on the, the evils or the goods of social media, but I, I think this is very helpful in um, thinking quite functionally if we have young people in our household, if we serve young people, you know, how we as psychologists can um, help inform the public health uh, because this tool is not going anywhere anytime soon. Oh, I think those just hearing that overview, Sarah, there were some really good key points for all of our social media health, not just uh, for kids in general. And I think one of the areas that I find so fascinating about this is now with telehealth, we're doing so much more through media, right? It's, um, you know, how do we discern this being live versus what folks are seeing just come across their screen and social media. And so I think super helpful to be having those conversations and to be thinking about these things. So great resources. Thank you for reviewing that. And a couple resources that I came up across, not so much news necessarily, um, but in my scurrying through the, uh, the Google archives <laughs> for just basic information in terms of HIPAA and some HIPAA toolkits, I came across uh, a website called healthit.gov and I came across their area of privacy and security resources for providers. I've never seen this before. It has a lot of really great information uh, in terms of both HIPAA as well as some detailed um, information that you can adopt and or learn about and add into your practice. And um, you'll find that in the toolkit side, but there's a lot of really good review information and information related to privacy and security topics. So I know we have questions that come up from time to time on these things. And I thought I would just uh, make sure to let everybody know about this resource and you can find um, the link to that dropped in the chat. Um, so I'm not going to read out the whole thing, but it's at healthit.gov and then you can do a little digging or you can click on uh, the link and it'll take you there. Um, the second thing that I uh, endeavored to do from our last telehealth chat was to find out more about cybersecurity policies. We've been talking about those that come up from time to time in passing. And I thought, I probably, I, you know, I read the, the trust website on it, but I really wanted to get a little bit more information, like who needs this? How do we know when we need it? When might this come about? What am I doing in my practice that would generate a need for this? Um, 
And so I did a little digging and the conclusion that I came about from a little bit of a, a scavenger hunt is uh, probably um, the easiest way to say it is you'll know if you need it <laughs> when you have a contract or when somebody says, hey, do you have a cybersecurity policy? And I know that kind of sounds like, well, how do I know that then? Um, but it sounds like if you happen to be working in contracts where you might be uh, providing services to another agency and they're asking for, do you have a cybersecurity policy? That's probably a time you need to call into the trust and um, walk through with the um, risk managers or the advocates uh, in terms of how this might relate to the work that you're doing. Everybody is going to be a bit different in this. And what I determined for my own situation is in my practice, I already have um, an electronic health record that is doing what it needs to do to cover um, those areas of security for my particular practice. But again, depending how you have yours set up or the services that you're using and or contracting with and providing, you're going to want to make a call to find out if that's something indeed that you may need. Generally, again, it'll come up if somebody's asking you if you have a policy for cybersecurity. So hopefully that gives you a little clue. If you haven't heard that already, then you probably don't need one, but always call in and find out. Uh, have a chat with the folks on the other end of the trust line. They're amazing and can walk you through what you need to know. So those were my homework assignments for, for this time. Sarah, I'll turn it over to you because I know we've got a little bit more of an update on the post PHE. Yes, and this actually aligns with one of the questions in the chat. So it's Kismet. Um, you know, I think last time on chat 19, we really dug into because with the, the end of the um, public health emergency was imminent at that time. So we tried to do a deeper dive on what expectations, you know, we had, um, you know, as indicated through uh, CMS and other uh, entities, about what to expect. So if anyone would like to do a deeper dive, I really want to encourage you to check out chat 19. We really do cover um, all the information we had available anyway. But I wanted to rehash those top three reminders. You know, people like threes. But the general concept is this is our first chat, you know, since the PHE has ended, the public health emergency has ended. And so the top three things we would encourage folks just to remember to do. First and foremost, make sure that the video conferencing product you're using and other technology products do comply with HIPAA, high tech and other federal regulations. Often, you know, you can know this because they will offer a business associates agreement or a BAA, which is a document that says you know, we understand that you have to comply with HIPAA. And so we're going to play by the rules too. During the pandemic, they, um, there were multiple entities that gave some leeway here. Um, notably, DHHS allowed us to use other products during that time to really make sure that we were doing our best to get access, get care to people who needed it. Now, you know, since the end of the public health emergency, we, we're going to see a reversion back to those previously held requirements of HIPAA compliant products. So that's one thing we can do. Second thing we can do for those of us who accept Medicare in our practice, um, there will be a requirement for an in-person meeting in addition to remote meetings within six months of initiating care. Um, now I should note this doesn't officially begin until January of 2025. So some folks um, I know might say, well gosh, you know I have time and that's absolutely true. Um, my general feeling is we know the change is coming. So it's wise, you know, to get it started now. And in fact, a lot of practices um, in my area I know have already begun this when they accept Medicare is to, you know, either as the first meeting or soon thereafter, certainly within six months, have that in-person meeting to complement um, the online care. And finally, um, making sure that we're checking in with the specific guidance of our jurisdiction, the state, province, you know, where we're practicing to make sure that we are aware of any, you know, rules or regulations they may have sought to relax 
um, or enforce during the pandemic. Notably, for example, where I live, um, there had been masking mandates, you know, that that has waxed and waned and changed and officially terminated um, with the end of the public health emergency. So those are probably our top three. I um, want to encourage folks, if you want to hear more about it, you know, check out Chat19. It does have kind of a deeper dive. So I Mark, think, please. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think it's great to always recap. And I love the idea of three, um, you know, to just keep those things in mind and, I know there's a few questions still uh, I'm seeing in the chat too, Sarah, about coding related to um, the changes of service. And, um, you know, as we kind of transition into some of those live questions, that might be one just to kind of connect in with this change of what's coming down the pike. And, um, you know, I think our guidance has consistently been, it's always good to double check. <laughs> I noted also in our chat that um, Dr. Kenneth Drude, who is also just this amazing telehealth luminary, uh, you know, noted that ASPPB has very helpful social media guidelines um, that you know our folks watching might be interested in as well. So that could complement some of the themes we're talking about. They weren't, you know, they weren't posted in the last month, but that's quite all right. They're fantastic, and I want to encourage folks to check them out. Fantastic. Well, do you want to switch into looking through some of our chat as we're getting do going? It. Let's do it. All right. So let's see. Um, I saw one excellent question. Um, forgive me. Uh, schedulers like Calendly, Simply Book, things like that, and the HIPAA compliance of these products. Really great question. So for folks who haven't used them, increasingly, you know, you'll see products that are integrated, perhaps, you know, with your email, perhaps um, with your mobile device that offer you the capability of having an externally facing calendar that patients could ostensibly schedule themselves in, um, very user friendly, typically, um, and you know, conducive to ease of scheduling. Um, unfortunately, many of them do not offer a business associates agreement. So, you know, the thing I want to encourage folks to do, and this is kind of the party line that Margo and I will often share, is check, you know, ask the company, do you comply with HIPAA standards? You know, do you offer a business associates agreement? This is where I think a lot of folks do opt to use scheduling software that's integrated into their electronic medical record. Now, I think the practical truth is it is often not as snazzy and shiny as some of the other products we can find in the marketplace. And that is the truth. So, you know, if there is a product you're particularly enamored with, I think it's certainly worthwhile to check in, you know, if they are offering a BAA, if they do offer, um, they offer those assurances. Um, but generally speaking, you know, I, I observe that uh, practically a lot of folks are electing to use those native uh, uh, scheduling softwares. I think the question too comes about, Sarah, because oftentimes those other programs are cheaper <laughs> and they're cheaper most of the time because they are not necessarily HIPAA compliant. If, if they do offer that, you probably have to add on or pay a different price for that because those HIPAA compliant servers cost more. Mm -hmm. And that really is kind of the bottom line, I think, in terms of what's going on behind the scenes for those companies. So um, do you see any other good ones in there? Let's see. There's quite a few questions regarding um, Medicare and that six month requirement. And please know this is something we'll go do a little bit of homework on and report back. But I do want to acknowledge the challenge that people are stating, which is, well, hold on. You know, if I'm seeing clients in, uh, let's say I have a SIPAC interjurisdictional, um, you know, uh, competency registered, and I want to see my clients, you know, in all those SIPAC participant states, and I want to accept Medicare to do so, how do I fulfill the brief? And I think it's a great question. <laughs> I wish I had an easy answer. You know, my best understanding is that, you know, we can expect to see this requirement again, January, 2025. However, I think that one upside of this long lead time is that these are questions people are going to be asking. So it's my sincere hope that we will start to see these addressed in public facing policy and answered. Um, but please know, we'll go do our homework and report back. Generally speaking, though, I want to acknowledge the challenge. And I think that this to me always speaks to when you are determining where you want to see your clients, 
you know, to be thoughtful about that. You know, I want to, when I choose to see a client remotely, I want to know a little bit about where they are and what resources are local to that client and how I could help them in emergent circumstances or if I needed to transfer care. Um, I appreciate so much the capacity to do this well through SIPACT, you know, and it opens up a new world of just thoughtfulness and pre-planning for, for our client care. I think that's a great segue to a theme of some of the other questions that I've been looking at related to interjurisdictional practice. And how do you know if you can see a patient in another jurisdiction? And as Sarah mentioned, the SIPAC um, is one option you may have if you're in one of those jurisdictions that you can apply for and receive that. Um, the other consideration is if you are doing this type of work is to look at the legal requirements of practice within the jurisdiction that that patient is located. Um, and so that is different in every jurisdiction. So it's not like there's one answer that we can provide on, on the call to help you know what that answer is. You have to go and look at the law for the jurisdiction in which that patient is located. And you have to look at that law in relation to your own practice um, where you're licensed and determine between those two if that is something that you legally can do. And I think once we take this question to a foreign jurisdiction, I know we had a couple questions about Canada and Australia and Germany. And, um, you know, if we're not Kind of, if we're thinking about what is the purpose of licensure, it's to protect the patient, the public, from um, folks that might not know how to practice appropriately and or be able to practice within that jurisdiction. And so it really is about their location, the, the patient's location and understanding, okay, if somebody's in Canada, where are they located in Canada? What is the law there? And what are the requirements that you would have um, or that might be uh, affecting the patient within that jurisdiction? So if they were to complain that there was a problem to their licensing board and that licensing board doesn't know anything about you, um, it's going to be a, a lot harder to protect that citizen from circumstances um, that they may need some assistance managing. So that's kind of the backdrop of where the licensing components come from. But what makes it doable for you as a provider is different. It requires you to know what those laws are, where the patient is, and for your practice laws, and if those two things can jive together um, or not. So it does require homework on your part. That's well said. You know, and it's it's another great example of when you're doing telehealth, you know. A good pregame is, is a solid plan. You know, that, that extra investment of thoughtfulness, that extra investment of time can save you tremendous stress later on. It's that adage of failing to plan is planning to fail <laughs> or <laughs> something like that, right? <laughs> that the more you can think about this before getting involved, um, you can at least start with some good knowledge and some good foundations. And you're never going to know all of the situations that could arise, but that gives you some good foundations of thinking through what can happen and how to be prepared. Margaret, shall we get on to some of those previously submitted questions and we'll come back to some more live questions? Uh, that sounds like a great plan. Okay. Um, several chats ago, we dug into the theme of artificial intelligence or AI in behavioral health. And we tried to do a deeper dive, you know, as to where, you know, what technologies are being developed, what's out there right now. And we received some great feedback from folks saying, well, that's great, but what does this mean to me as an independent practitioner? How would this be relevant to my practice? And I thought it was a great question. Um, and there was worthy of a little bit more um, attention to detail. So, you know, we've covered this a little bit previously, but we want to talk a little bit about those types of tools we see integrated into the practice of everyday psychologists and, you know, what that's starting to look like. And again, as we talked about um, in the prior chat, 
we're seeing a trend, you know, towards the um, FDA approval of digital therapeutics, some of which do have AI integration. You know, we see a trend of large scale hospital systems and even some electronic health records integrating AI. So there's kind of this, this trend that's moving it into the tools we use, the institutions, you know, that govern us. And so I think that we can expect we're just going to see AI popping up more and more in our sort of clinical concept of standard of care. You know, additionally, um, recently I've seen some wonderful information put out, American Telemedicine Association, American Psychological Association, all offering various CEs that are AI focused and panels. So, you know, I think it's in our public conversation. And again, you know, we all hear stories about rogue chatbots menacing the internet. And, you know, today we're really just thinking about, you know, what are the applications of AI that are relevant to us? You know, we talked a little bit last time about those relational agents, those fully automated um, chatbots that uh, are interacting directly um, with clients. And I think um, have in some ways uh, created a circumstance in which therapists are not participating. You know, I, we could make an argument that there's data being put into the large language models that inform AI, you know, by therapists, but, but really ultimately, you know, these were direct client AI interactions. So I think it's notable that for the um, average, you know, therapist, the average psychologist, you know, we have tools that are going to be um, much more sort of hybrid models. So I wanted to mention specifically a few companies that are out there doing kind of an in-between model. In particular, there are several companies that are um, offering the ability to interact with AI relational agents, you know, that populate a language model with content that's approved by the therapist. So I think this is a very interesting idea, um, but it's something that a practitioner can sign up for that says, well, if you wanted like an FAQ for your clients of, you know, information that you would want them to have, you know, could your client then, you know, access this resource and in turn um, access your Sage Council? Again, you know, I think there's not a lot of regulation here, and this is really kind of on the cutting edge, but I mentioned this not because it's something we will use today, but it's the type of products we see being developed. So if I had, you know, Sarah's top 10 things to do when you can't sleep, you know, could that be put into a format that patients could access when it's 2 a.m. and they can't sleep and they want to know what their provider would have to say about this? Um, I'd say on a more day-to-day -day basis, we're starting to see some data collection be automated through the use of AI. Notably, um, we see in uh, Cerner and MyChart and some of those large-scale electronic health records, um, the integration of the collection of behavioral health data like the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7. I know when I go to my primary care doctor these days, instead of being handed the survey, the little clipboard you know, with the surveys, these days there's a kiosk or there's an iPad that I go to that you know, uses branching AI to answer my questions, um, to answer the questions and populate them into my chart. So when, when I have my checkup, you know, that data is available. And I think we're gonna start to see this more available to the average practitioner. We're gonna start seeing this more available in the electronic health record products that we use. I think always this brings up a lot of questions we're gonna talk about in a moment. You know, so for example, if I'm completing the PHQ-9 and I indicated on the item um, regarding self-harm that I was having ideation about self-harm, you know, how do we make sure that that information gets to a human being who can act appropriately? But generally speaking, again, we're gonna start seeing more integration of AI into online tools commonly used by psychologists into our apps, into our EHRs, you know, into our software generally. We're gonna start seeing integration into digital therapeutics, those apps we might recommend for our clients. Um, and we're gonna start seeing integration into large scale health systems, often um, programs that are supported by employers or programs that are um, directly connected with the insurance carrier itself. So, you know, what are the concerns? So what? <laughs> you know, I think we need to be thinking about clinical safety. You know, how do we make sure that we use the tools we can use, um, but also use them in a way that uh, safeguards, you know, our clients' privacy, confidentiality, and, and most of all, preserves our capacity to have good clinical judgment. Right now, today, we could go out and buy a productivity tool that would listen to our sessions and take our notes. So there's actually AI right now that, um, can listen and chart for us, which you know I think had its roots in many ways as an assistive technology. Um, and you know there's a tremendous 
potential use for this and you know, I have to think through the ethics of, all right, you know, so when I use technology to help me take notes and, you know, to document, who's deciding what's important? You know, how am I determining, am I having adequate influence in determining what goes into clinical records? Am I adhering to minimum record keeping standards if I wish to? You know, am I being really thoughtful about what I think is most clinically salient, you know, as the person who knows my client? So again, not advocating for the good or the bad of these tools, just acknowledging they exist. And, you know, so, so what do we need to think about? So safety, we need to think about clinical effectiveness um, and the role of when, you know, we need to step in with our clinical judgment. And most of all, this just highlights for me, there's this lovely opportunity for us to be involved. You know, these products are being developed now and we have this opportunity for us to be a part of the conversation. So, you know, the more we can be thoughtful about this, the more we can participate in the research, the more we can participate in the development. I think there's this lovely opportunity to help inform a future, you know, that highlights um, all the, the functionality and productivity while retaining what is uniquely compelling to the humans that practice psychology. Oh, Sarah, I think this is such good information. And I know we're throwing out uh, several different, um, yeah, short forms of the things that we're talking about. So PHQ-9 and GAD, can you help our viewers <laughs> understand yes. and interpret that? Yes. These are two measures, and I should... Is the patient health questionnaire nine thing. <laughs> um, PHQ-9 is a nine item survey that primarily um, assesses for depressive symptoms, but is often used as just a general behavioral health um, indicator. I see functionally is often how it's used. Um, the GAD-7 assesses is a seven item measure that assesses for anxiety. Um, neither of them, I think, uh, each of them have a threshold that if folks disclose a certain number of symptoms, you know, more, more assessment is indicated. So they're kind of nice first stops in your assessment batteries. So that's why we often see them uh, implemented in primary care settings because they tend to be brief. They tend to be straightforward. They have a lot of face validity. So somebody just reads it and they know the question you're asking. You know, they're not asking if you would some obtuse you know, question that requires a lot of um, interpretation, pretty straightforward and on the nose. So, you know, these measures are pretty ubiquitous in uh, primary care because they can help the primary care doctor determine whether a referral is indicated to behavioral health. So I think we can understand, we can understand why they're used often. And I can certainly understand why they would be a good first stop for AI integration, you know, in that, okay, well, we collect this data routinely, we want it in the chart, you know, and so I think it's a nice first stop in terms of collecting behavioral health data in a way that's efficient. You know, always the question is, where does the data go? And that would be the case with the surveys too. It's like, do you read the survey or does the survey just get stuck under a clipboard and nobody actually looks at it? So too, you know, are these responses aggregated and sent to the provider? And if there's a particular item that's disclosed that's problematic, like indicating self-harm or something like that, is it flagged and brought to the attention of the provider? So, you know, again, it, it is not the tool one way or another, it's what are we doing, you know, with the information? It's such good points. And I think also, if we're not doing anything with the information, why are we collecting it? Right, right. Why are we absorbing <laughs> the risk of like exactly. collecting information? Yeah. Uh, and I think the other piece of this too, is really understanding that this can be automated. This can all happen in the background and we can allow uh, our memory to maybe not be as in the moment or at the forefront of our conversations with patients thinking that there's some tool that's transcribing this all or keeping track of it all. And that's one of the pieces that I see as perhaps maybe more problematic than actually, you know, having too much data and not looking through it all is this idea that we might be relying on things um, and not as in the moment or engaged because of that. And so I just, I wanted to just mention that in, in thinking through a number of these areas where we can have a lot of efficiencies occurring, uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't still be kind of going through the same process and engaging with our patients in the ways that we've always done. Well, I saw a question in the chat that's actually about the next question from last chat. So about you know, acknowledging the the um, 
practice that uh, many folks transitioning from therapy to coaching and, and that phenomenon. And, um, you know, what does that mean? So Margo, I know you had prepared um, some comments on that. So that was a question submitted to us last time as well. I did. So that's a great segue. <laughs> I try. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, I think this is something we've seen a lot of is um, people kind of turning to coaching. Um, and we've had throughout the chats a number of questions about this. And, um, you know, we, we did a little digging because uh, it's really helpful, I think, to understand what are the distinctions and or at least what the common threads of distinction are. And um, that's one piece of it. The other piece is you need to read your laws again. <laughs> And I'll come back to that. I kind of sound like a broken record on that. But personal coaching um, really tends to focus mostly with well-functioning individuals. We're not looking to um, diagnose, you know, treat any particular medical condition or diagnosable mental health condition. We're really in coaching, thinking about working on a set of goals, maybe accountability for those goals, maximizing personal development or sometimes professional development if we're talking about executive coaching um, and or navigating some fairly typical pathways um, to accomplishing things that we set out as goals. That's distinctly different to thinking about um, behavioral health concerns, uh, problems that are getting in the way of you functioning in everyday life that are related to a diagnosable mental health or medical condition. And we're not uh, really in coaching thinking about anything that is curing, treating, uh, or necessarily preventing those kinds of conditions. So I think in general, when we look at definitions, those are really the distinctions that we're seeing in terms of these different um, areas of interacting with folks in our professional world who are coming as clients. Um, with that said, there can be still the same tools that we might use in terms of what we know from empirically validated approaches of cognitive um, or um, behavioral health phenomenon, where we look at how to motivate behavior, right? I, I might think of a goal that I am really invested in, in targeting and um, utilizing some, you know, rewards for that could be quite good. Does that constitute the practice of psychology versus coaching? It actually depends on the state that you are in when you're doing that. In some states, the laws are silent on this. In some states, the laws are very specific and say if you are working with somebody in um, a setting that is a professional setting and you are utilizing things that relate or interventions that relate to psychology, that may still constitute an activity that requires a license. And so that may fall within the scope of coaching, it may fall within the scope of psychology, it may fall within the scope of some other um, behavioral health uh, interventionist, um, but you have to read the laws and you might not find them in psychology. You might find them in other allied professions or um, other areas of the practice laws. So that's kind of the um, definitions and regulations in a nutshell. And if we kind of take it to one step further in how do you get paid to do this, most generally, coaching is not going to be something that's covered by a healthcare plan, um, or um, in other words, it may be more of a uh, private pay situation. Sometimes uh, it may be paid by an employer for the purposes uh, that are outlined in terms of goals for executive coaching, things like that. So 
hopefully that kind of summarizes that in a nutshell. It's, of course, gray and not clear. Uh, <laughs> so there's still room to read up and learn more about the things that you may want to do uh, if you're transitioning to that in your practice. Thanks so much, Margo. And I, I so appreciate you highlight you know, the manner in which jurisdiction to jurisdiction is really variable, you know, and some jurisdictions really have opined, oh, yes, this is a psychological service, you must be licensed to provide it, you know, and some have not. And so I think, you know, our, our liability, you know, in terms of as, as licensed psychologists is so variable, depending on where we practice that, you know, it's definitely worth the extra research. Well, I made reference earlier, we were going to talk a little bit about equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging in the context of telehealth. And, you know, that was, um, this has been, you know, something that is showing up quite a bit in the telehealth research. It was a question that was submitted last time. Um, and of course, we had our Tech for Moms, uh, Tech to Save Moms Act, you know, so I think there's an opportunity to dig in a little bit today. And I think for, for folks who have been doing this work, um, I think telehealth is at the, the, the heart of it is really this mission of access. I know when I began seeing clients, I think I started seeing my telehealth clients in 2007, you know, and it was at that time we were working with the most remote communities, you know, folks that did not have access to evidence-based psychological care in other contexts. And I think we saw this really writ large in the context of the pandemic where, I mean, fundamental access, you know, wherein we were trying to protect the public health. So this can be conceptually a tool for inclusion, uh, inclusion in terms of direct clinical care to serving clients where they are, a tool for inclusion in terms of training and connecting folks to diverse um, schools of thought and diverse opportunities to train with mentors and an opportunity to diversify our research and really um, include more people in our research. However, increasingly research finds, um, and especially the data coming out of the pandemic where we just saw an explosion of telehealth clients served, that you know, we're finding disparities in the, in the access provided to healthcare through um, virtual means. And, and specifically, um, tremendous disparity in the context of socioeconomic status and tremendous racial disparities. This widened in response to this meaningful rollout of telehealth services in the pandemic. And I want to acknowledge this is in medicine broadly. You know, we're having those findings and there are exceptions to the rule, certainly. Um, but, you know, we're seeing this also in behavioral health. And, and I think the data that I've read said that children may especially be impacted, you know, by this finding. So I think there's a lot of intersectionality when you look at the whys of it um, with systemic bias, with systematic racism and um, socioeconomic loss of opportunity. So some of the issues include the availability of reliable internet. And we know that folks live in traditionally underserved communities may be less likely to have this infrastructure available. You know, the internet, the reliable technology necessary to receive the care, um, all of these cost money. You know, when we're talking about socioeconomic divides, you know, we can kind of see the cascading impacts of this. You know, do you have a private endpoint in which to receive your care? Well, that requires a home with an extra room that's not in use, you know, and so forth. You know, I think there are myriad factors that we all well understand impact traditionally underserved communities. Um, and we just kind of see this cascade into issues in healthcare. I think there's also, you know, kind of a PR issue. There's a perception concern, concerns for privacy and confidentiality. If I'm in a community that has historically been marginalized, been mistreated, you know, I may have reservations about this new way of being approached um, and this new way of receiving care. And then, of course, you know, opportunity. So the technical skills that we might learn in the context of professional opportunity, in the context of educational opportunity, if we are denied those opportunities, in turn, that can result in a lower technological literacy that to access our healthcare. So we can kind of see the cascading impacts of systematic bias and how they can keep people away from equitable healthcare access. So how do we address this? Um, you know, certainly more study. I think there's more research to understand how, you know, how do we make this better? How do we get the right tools to the right people at the right time. And I think for me, you know, as an individual, I'm really being thoughtful about what's the right care that meets my clients' needs. You know, first telehealth was telephone. <laughs> you know, it doesn't always need to be, you know, the coolest, most high-tech solution we have. It needs to be the right tool for the right circumstance. So are we really being thoughtful about our clients' circumstances and what's going to meet their needs? And, you know, Technology has tremendous opportunity to bridge that gap. I've certainly worked in programs that sends folks, you know, easy to use, 
internet enabled technology, you know, direct to their door. We have the capacity in some circumstances, but as, as always, you know, we want to think about hybrid models. You know, it is a rare day when I'm not advocating for telehealth, but I do think it's the case that we need to make sure that we are building a future where telehealth access is more equitable and simultaneously making sure that we are maintaining equitable access right now in person through virtual means and otherwise. So I'll pause there, um, but I think that for me, it's a call to action to make sure that I'm looking at my own clinical caseloads and that I'm being thoughtful, you know, when I'm participating in, in discussions and meetings about telehealth to really bring that lens. I really appreciate that, Sarah. And I'm just gonna circle back to reminding folks about, at the core, this is about appropriate care. Um, and, you know, making sure that, like you said, um, whether it's telehealth or whether it's in person, that there is access to that care and making sure as telehealth providers that we're really providing appropriate care and making those determinations as to whether this patient in this circumstance, in their circumstance at this time, that telehealth makes sense. Um, you know, do we know what those safety and emergency procedures are that um, will benefit them if something were to happen at this point? Is there a need for that in-person time, right? Um, you know, clearly the government is thinking that maybe once every six months <laughs> having in-person might be a good idea, but maybe it's actually more than that based on our own clinical determinations. And maybe the telehealth is just kind of an in-between um, some of those times. So I just want to remind folks about the importance of really thinking through appropriate care as a basis before we're kind of moving through all of those other areas of the things that make care even more possible. Certainly. I mean, clinical judgment is king, you know, and, and we have all these amazing new tools to use to serve our clients and meet them where they're at, but nothing replaces, you know, the folks who are out there doing the work. Absolutely. We've I had some, so many yeah. awesome questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I jotted a few down. I don't know. Do you, what do you want to start with? Sure. So, okay, I saw one question about social media and um, advertising, one's practice. And yeah. this is what I think that, you know, comes up with some frequency. Um, you know, I think that we do see that folks are advertising their practices in all kinds of different medium, you know, where, where, where clients are. I wanna encourage folks to <clears throat> bring a lens to it that asks questions, you know, questions like, is this something that um, is static or dynamic? So if I post about Dr. Sarah's awesome psychology practice, is this something that uh, patients can get on, comment on, identify themselves on? You know, am I putting myself in a context where someone's going to go on and say, well, Dr. Sarah is the best and I saw her as a patient. Now we have all seen Yelp, we've all seen other places, um, Better Business Bureau, I mean, there, there are all kinds of places where this is possible, but wherever possible, I really wanna encourage folks to, um, to turn off those functions. So wherever possible, making it difficult for folks to identify themselves, making it difficult for folks to um, accidentally uh, violate their own privacy or confidentiality. And I want to acknowledge, I mean, people can do all sorts of things. People can go right on their own social media about their lovely doctor who they like. You know, they can retweet a tweet and say, well, listen to what my doctor had to say. People can do all sorts of things, you know, but the more thoughtful we are about not making it easy, you know, and really trying to put information out that's engaging without inviting clinical level of interaction. You know, for example, I saw someone advertising not too long ago on Instagram and they were saying, you know, feeling sad, DM me you know, come tell me about it. And I thought, oh, no, <laughs> you know, don't do that. You know, not because that isn't a great way to reach people, but because they're inviting people to write them about their clinical issues in a context that is not heavy compliant, that's not high tech compliant. You know, so I think that there are these opportunities to, yes, make people aware of the services we offer, but I really want to encourage um, folks to think about how to make that more of a static advertisement and not an invitation for clinical engagement in an inappropriate milieu. 
I think that's really wise for a couple of reasons. People will do this, <laughs> whether or not you want them to, or whether or not you tell them not to. So that's one piece of it. The second piece is in some jurisdictions, you may be soliciting um, patients and that may not be allowed within the context of the practice act within that jurisdiction. So these are things you want to think about. Social media is viewed around the world. You don't know where that Instagram post, uh, well, actually you can tell where that Instagram post goes. You can look in your analytics, but you can't control that yourself. And so you have a global sense of what's going on when you're on social media, if you're advertising there, but you can't control exactly who you're targeting and or who's receiving that. And so that becomes a challenge uh, to some degree. And some entities do offer professional versions. So, you know, for example, um, you know, Facebook, I think acknowledged this some years ago <clears throat> and they offer like Facebook professional pages. They suffer some of the same challenges, you know, but they do tend to have fewer, you know, so I think from a risk management standpoint, you know, I, I want to acknowledge like this is riskier than having a wooden sign with my name on it. Um, this is riskier than just having a LinkedIn page, you know, potentially. I don't know. Think about that statement. You know, all of these suffer, you know, some of these challenges, but the more we can do to stick to medium that allow us to have some control, um, I think the, the better risk managed we are. And I think planning ahead and having social media policies um, that you actually have thought through are how you're conducting yourself in terms of that public facing side and what you're doing with information or analytics you might be looking at from the back end side and having those policies available for people to know and see is really helpful. And check out those ASPPB guidelines on social media, check out the American Psychological Association guidance for young people. You know, all of this, I think, helps us inform good policies for our own practices. I saw a question, there, there's so many good ones. I saw a question asking about a list of approved products and I wanted to share in the frustration. I'm not aware of a singular list, you know, for like the approved products. I do want to acknowledge that, um, as I mentioned earlier, increasingly FDA is um, approving some digital therapeutics, you know, some um, sort of apps and things that our clients can use. Um, and that I wanted to mention the American Psychological Association has a technology um, column called Let's Get Technical, and they'll often do product reviews there. So that's, you can look there. And the American Telemedicine Association similarly will time to time have a product review um, area you can look at. So I would encourage you to look at those resources. And I see that Dr. Martin has rejoined us, which means it's five minutes to the hour. And I will hand it back over to Dr. Martin. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, thank you both uh, for uh, handling so many interesting questions, both those from previous uh, presentations and then the ones today. There are always more questions than we can manage, but as we've evidenced today, we carry those over and do our best to address them in the next session if possible.